Thank you. Thank you. Oops, I got my second page first. Welcome. I just am so thrilled to welcome you to the hall. It's so wonderful to see familiar faces that I haven't seen in two years. It's welcome to wonderful. It's so wonderful to welcome um, so many Duquesne friends tonight. And we are also welcoming, yes, plop, plop, yeah, get that going. I heard it. <laughs> And we also have so many households who are viewing uh, from home. So there are over 300 of you. So thank you and welcome to those households. Thank you for joining us on our Made Local series. And what a grand occasion to gather on a beautiful night celebrating the Pittsburgh launch of the quintessential Pittsburgh novel that we've all been waiting for, Ken. The Heiress of Pittsburgh, by friend to many, best-selling author and university and civic leader, Ken Gormley. Hello, I'm Stephanie Flom, Executive Director of Pittsburgh Arts and Lectures, and on behalf of our board and our staff, again, welcome. Made Local is presented in partnership with our friends at the Carnegie Library of Pittsburgh. A sincere thank you to the library in whose house we are. A shout out to White Whale Bookstore, who's here with signed copies of Ken's book. Ken is happy to personalize your books after the talk. We're gonna start the signing line right here and Caitlin will help you. Following his remarks, Ken will be joined in conversation with Magistrate Judge Maureen Kelly, who is, yeah, we're so thrilled to have her. Maureen has provided abounding civic service to our city and state in numerous leadership roles, including co-chairing the Allegheny County Bar Association's Gender, e Gender Equality Committee, serving as the president of Neighborhood Legal Services Association, and chairing the Equal Justice Under Law campaign, to name a few. Introducing Ken Gormley, on behalf of Carnegie Library of Pittsburgh, is Library Chair and Life Trustee, Patrick Dowd. Patrick currently serves as the Chief Operating Officer for the Allegheny County Health Department. Previously, he served as the inaugural Executive Director of Allies for Children, a child advocacy nonprofit. Patrick has provided robust service and leadership to our city as an elected official on the Pittsburgh Board of Education and on Pittsburgh City Council. Please welcome Patrick Dowd. Patrick? Thank you. Thanks, Stephanie. As Stephanie said, my name is Patrick Dowd. I'm the chair of the board of the trustees at the Carnegie Library of Pittsburgh. And it's really exciting to be here with you tonight. Uh, the Carnegie Library of Pittsburgh is a proud partner with Pittsburgh Arts and Lecture for this series, Made Local, which features the literary works of local talent. And it is, I gotta just again say, it's really wonderful to be here with you in person. Um, we all know that this has been a difficult, challenging two years for all of us. Um, and for libraries as well, it's been a challenging two years for libraries. So as we move into this new period, let's hope, um, I want to encourage all of you to head off to your local libraries, to check out a great book, uh, to participate in a wonderful program, uh, and to make some new connections. I can tell you at the Carnegie Library of Pittsburgh, we're going to be looking forward to seeing you in person. So please take advantage of all the libraries in this region. And now to this evening's lecture. I have the distinct honor of introducing Duquesne University President Ken Gormley. Tonight, President Gormley could lecture us with scholarly aplomb about the United States Constitution, the roles of the different branches of government, uh, the power and the import of the First Amendment. He could hold us spellbound with stories about Archibald Cox, the rule of law, and the role of the individual. He literally wrote that book. He could tell us all we've ever wanted to know or maybe that we've forgotten as it relates to the Clinton impeachment and the role of the special prosecutor in that process. He also wrote that book. 
and he could share his learned insights about President Truman's attempted nationalization of the steel industry about 70 years ago and the landmark Supreme Court decision that resulted from that. We would listen to that lecture and we would walk out of this hall all the more, all the wiser, all the more intelligent for having listened. President Gormley could also regale us with stories about his leadership of Duquesne University, an anchor institution in this community. He could talk about the growth of student population there, the construction of important buildings and the transformation of a campus and a community. He could more importantly still talk about the establishment of groundbreaking programs. Just recently, for example, President Gormley and Duquesne University announced the formation of the College of Osteopathic Medicine. Like all that he's done in this community and at Duquesne University, this change, this important program will be so beneficial for the students and our communities. It's really, uh, it would be a fantastic lecture to listen to him talk about those topics as well. But that's not really why we're here. Tonight, we're here to listen to Ken Gormley, lifelong lover of all things Pittsburgh and a native son. We're here to learn about his new endeavor, his new work, The Heiress of Pittsburgh. It's a work of fiction that tells us about our region and a lot of great, fantastic details of our region, tells us about ourselves and probably a little bit about our, uh, our guest lecturer tonight, President Gormley, Ken Gormley. Ken Gormley grew up in Swissvale when life there still revolved around the switch, the union switch and signal. He is a proud graduate of St. Anselm's Elementary School where his mother taught, and I think he's an even prouder graduate of St. Anselm Anselm's High School. He has, suffice to say, the Mon Valley in his bones and in his blood. Ken Gormley went to Pitt, uh, and as he'll tell you, he went there because he could get the bus into Oakland, and he was very successful there. He went on to Harvard Law School, where he was also equally successful and kind of had it made, if you will. Um, but like the main character of his work of fiction, Ken decided to come back to his beloved hometown. And again, like the main character of his new fictional work, Ken decided to dedicate himself to service of others here in his hometown and all of our communities. He's done that as a lawyer. He's done that as the mayor of uh, Forest Hills. He's done that as a scholar and as a university president. So ladies and gentlemen, I ask you to please welcome lifelong Pittsburgher, true son of this region, constitutional scholar, university president, former mayor of Forest Hills, and perhaps most importantly this evening, author of The Heiress of Pittsburgh, Ken Gormley. Thank you very much, Patrick, and good evening. My thanks to Carnegie Library and Stephanie Flom, Caitlin, and the Pittsburgh Arts and Lecture Series for hosting this special event this evening. Uh, I was thinking last night how special this really is for me. As Patrick said, I grew up in actually Edgewood and Swissvale, about five miles east from here, uh, spent many evenings and weekends in the library here. My dad would drive us down, or sometimes on Saturdays, my friend Matt Kennedy and I would actually head up Commercial Street in Swissvale past the slag dumps and walk all the way here to spend the day in the library stacks just reading. And it was here in this building that I developed a love for the written word uh, started daydreaming that maybe one day I could be a writer. And so 50 plus years later, it's truly special to be here with you to talk about my first novel, which has been a labor of love since I started it. So let me tell you first how I came to write this book and what it's about. Uh, then I'll look forward to answering questions from our fabulous moderator, Judge Maureen Kelly, and also from all of you in the audience. Uh, first, in terms of how the novel came about, as Patrick mentioned, I've written a few nonfiction books that were fortunately successful. 
Uh, but I can tell you, if any of you are thinking of becoming authors, writing a novel is a hundred times scarier because unlike fiction, when you th uh, unlike nonfiction, when you think about it, fiction has no exact beginning or end to the story. There's no birth date of the principal character in the story. There's no career trajectory to chronicle. You've got to invent the whole thing. Every day you wake up, sit at your desk, and you have to dig into your imagination to create these imaginary characters and made up locations that look and feel like real places. And it has to be woven together to tell a compelling story. And it can't just be a story that you care about. It has to be a story that appeals to these unknown readers who will one day pass judgment on your book in swift and brutal assessments like, too wordy, not detailed enough. I don't like these characters. These characters are too perfect. Or the most damning assessment of all, I can tell you as a writer, it's fine. It's fine after all of this, and then you go back to watching reruns of The Office on Netflix because you like that better. So writing a novel is a personal and a humbling experience. Uh, it's purely subjective art form. Pat Conroy, uh, who my first agent, Julian Bach, represented, had his first book rejected a hundred times before it was turned into an international blockbuster, The Prince of Tides. And Emily Dickinson's poetry, you may know, was largely ignored and unpublished until well after her death, but she didn't care. And Emily Dickinson said that the pursuit of her writing releases a little demon inside her that she couldn't suppress. So when you're writing fiction, you don't know for sure if that demon will, present, uh, will produce a smash hit or something that will be ending up in the recycled book bin. Uh, so why do you even embark on writing a novel? Well, first, because you can't help it. You have to love it. You have to want to get up every day and do it because that's who you are. And you have to care about this story that's taking shape inside your mind so much that you're prepared to finish it even if the book never gets to print. As long as you've told the story that you felt you needed to tell, then you've accomplished your job. And hopefully at least a few people will read it so that it touches others, so that it advances the human condition even in a small way, which is of course the ultimate goal for a writer. Uh, so let me tell you about my own journey in writing The Heiress of Pittsburgh, and incidentally it had many other titles that I scrapped along the way. Uh, this story was bubbling up inside of me for decades. I started working on it over 30 years ago when I was a young lawyer at the firm of Sindrich and Titus downtown and also teaching as an adjunct professor here at Pitt Law School. Even before I started writing those nonfiction books that Patrick talked about, I began toying with the idea of writing a novel, and I knew I wanted it to be about Pittsburgh. So uh, the main character in the story is this guy named Sean Rossi, and it is true like him. I grew up in this little working class town of Swissvale, attended Pitt right down the street here, and then miraculously I found myself admitted to Harvard Law School. They do let in a couple of Pittsburghers every once in a while. <laughs> Uh, and so I went off there to figure out how to make my mark. And so there were these superficial similarities that created a shell around which to build the novel. And you do need a framework to start with. Uh, but the story that took shape in the heiress of Pittsburgh was and tr still truly is pure fiction. And that's where all of the hard work came in. Uh, I was obsessed with trying to capture Pittsburgh as a character in the book. Having grown up in this gritty little mill town in the Mon Valley, uh, before I left for law school, I came to realize how incredibly special these little towns in Pittsburgh and places like it really were. They were filled with bigger than life characters. Everyone had a nickname. They were primarily immigrants or grandchildren of immigrants of every color and ethnic stripe imaginable. They were funny, irreverent, uh, pretty simple in their needs. They were fabulous storytellers, rock on tours. And at the same time, they were devoted, loyal, inventive, and talented, uh, especially in making things with their hands, I would say. And even though many of them, Patrick and I were talking about this, 
didn't have a lot of formal education, they were great at doing so many things. And most importantly, they were ready to step up and do anything if someone needed help. Uh, and I'm sure many of your family members represent those same qualities. The place itself was filled with all this vivid imagery, and I just couldn't shake it out of my mind. When I went away to law school, I would close my eyes at night, and I could see these pictures in my head, the red and orange flames roaring up out of the blast furnaces along the river at night, uh, the belching smokestacks next to them, the hills and valleys where these modest little row houses were lined with insel brick, uh, and also these churches with crooked crosses that signified the Eastern European Rite. These hardworking communities where people looked out for each other and they celebrated together births, baptisms, weddings, and uh, even mourning together at funeral homes. And we talked about this. I actually saw this where viewing rooms for caskets were at times adorned with pictures of Kennywood Park or Dorothy Six Blast Furnace or other scenes that depicted the arc of the lives that were most important to these people. Uh, so I wanted to write what amounted to a great poem about these places, a, a love story about Pittsburgh, because today, in most places, these simple qualities and virtues are dying off, and I always say that you couldn't buy them for a million dollars. But how is a person supposed to reduce these things to words on a piece of paper? It wasn't easy at all. And you have to figure out how to capture these distinctive people and this sooty, rough, but really beautiful imagery. And I always imagined it was like an artist toiling over trying to capture a scene in an oil painting. Um, I felt a lot of pressure not to screw this project up because I felt I had an obligation to do justice to these remarkable working class towns. Uh, that really, in my view, summed up the very best qualities of America, but again, are slowly vanishing. So this novel opens with a scene in the North Braddock Catholic Cemetery. Have any of you ever been to the North Braddock Catholic Cemetery? Okay. Uh, here a grave is being dug up for DNA test in a court case, and a group of onlookers watch with trepidation. And here I try to paint a picture from that vantage point on the hillside. So here's the opening. High above the bend in the Monongahela River, which flowed south to north toward the city, I could see ancient grave markers, Roman Catholic crucifixes, Byzantine crosses, and other tributes to the dead that were stained with mill soot but otherwise nicely preserved. Instead of pointing skyward toward heaven, these memorials slope downward to provide a sweeping view of the Edgar Thompson steel plant, the last operating mill in the valley where Andrew Carnegie had created his steel empire in the 1880s, and the silenced blast furnaces of the Kerry Furnace, which had once supplied molten pig iron to the adjacent mills. In these communities, most local families had found work, constructed simple homes, and built livelihoods during the industrial migration of a past era. So next, the workers pull up this casket and the exhumation takes a surprise turn. And this is where the story kind of gets up on its feet and starts walking around on its own and develops a plot as the characters discover that the wrong body is in the coffin. So here's a little excerpt. As the lid rose, rain doused the coffin's moldy silk liner one worker covered his mouth, suppressing the urge to gag. Judge Wendell hurriedly lit a Kent cigarette and sucked down a bolus of menthol smoke. A light-skinned black man with graying hair, the judge was known for maintaining his cool under fire. Now his eyes opened to the size of quarters. He seemed interested in viewing the decedent, whose alleged act of sexual gratification a half century earlier had spawned this messy, messy will contest and consumed a week of his orphan's court calendar. That's one ugly biddy, exclaimed the worker with the bandana, peering inside. We all stared at the corpse. Even 30 years after death, she would have benefited from a radical nose job. Who the hell is this, Bernie pointed at the imposter. The woman in the coffin wore a purple chiffon dress discolored by green mold and a white wig that had jarred loose. 
Her wrinkled face with its hooked Eastern European nose had become eerily wax-colored from embalming fluid and the passage of time. That's the grave wax, the deputy coroner whispered to the judge. This sure as hell ain't Ralph Akmovic, the guy we're looking for. Um, so I wanted to use Pittsburgh as a character in the book, and I wanted to build the framework around this battle in court over inheriting a multi-million dollar trust fund in orphans court. Uh, most people, incidentally, including most lawyers, don't know much about that court. It's a sort of archaic, mysterious place where disputes over wills and estates and trusts have been fought out, often with dramatic outcomes. Uh, as a young lawyer, I had handled some cases in Orphan's Court, and this obscure place, which is hidden away at the top of the Frick Building, seemed like a living, breathing soap opera to me. The ugliest secrets about families and ex-families came spilling out in these Orphan Court proceedings, and the judges there tended to handle things their own way to bring order to chaos. And so here's how Judge Warren Wendell, a character in the story, deals with one outburst. The judge grabbed his gavel and banged it repeatedly to restore order. Let's try to maintain some professional decorum here, Judge Wendell said, holding up his hand as if to stop a runaway truck. We're an orphan's court. Do all of you understand the significance of that? We don't tolerate loud disruptions or shouting around here. Do you all catch my drift? The judge leaned over the bench, stared directly at Drew Morris, and whispered, because all of our clients are dead. Uh, so in one case I handled in orphan's court, I remember learning something that jolted me. I discovered how brutally unwed mothers and their so-called illegitimate children were treated by their communities, but also by the legal system. And as recently as into the 1970s, under the law, as it existed for a hundred years, these mothers and babies couldn't even inherit uh, like other normal people because they were considered children of no one, stamped with a badge of shame. Uh, and I did research and found out about this place called the Rosalia Foundling Home. It was a home for unwed mothers in the Hill District, not far from here where pregnant girls in Pittsburgh were often sent to have their babies in secret and where they then often put these babies up for adoption so their sins wouldn't be discovered by their neighbors and family members. And I even located some of the amazing sisters of charity who had worked in the Rosalia home uh, going back to the 50s and 60s before it moved from the Hill District actually to o Oakland. And they shared stories about how they protected these girls and their babies uh, so fiercely because the system was so totally stacked against them. And so this tension involving unwed mothers and their so-called bastard children became the center of conflict in this courtroom piece of the drama. So the main character in the story and the narrator, Sean Rossi, has come back to Pittsburgh after he went off to Harvard. He set up his own little estates firm trying to do good for the people where he grew up. And now he's dragged into representing his ex-college girlfriend, Marjorie, who dumped him just as he graduated from law school, taking off for California. Marjorie's mother, Lil, we learn at the trial, got pregnant out of wedlock as a teenager. She claims it was a low-life boy named Ralph Akmovic who took her to the Kennywood picnic and then took advantage of her in the Kennywood parking lot. So Lil was sent off by her parents to the Rosalia home, and that's where Marjorie was born, kept secret by the nuns who guarded these girls fiercely. Marjorie was supposed to be put up for adoption, but a kind Polish nun with big ears and a round bonnet uh, uh, on her head convinced the family to keep the baby and raise her as the child of the grandmother who they then called Aunt Peg to obscure the true identity of the mother. And this was truly how it happened many, many times back then. Now, as the courtroom uh, trial in front of Judge Wendell escalates, Marjorie and her family need to prove that she's the legitimate, illegitimate daughter of Ralph Akmovic 
and convinced the judge that the harsh laws that existed that dealt with illegitimate children that were in effect at the time this trust was created shouldn't apply. And that's the only way that they can inherit several million dollars from this hidden trust fund. Otherwise, the family is going to lose everything. Sean is still bitter and resentful about Marjorie dumping him. He's also freaked out that she's reappeared now. Uh, his wife, Christine, recently died of ovarian cancer. He's struggling to come to grips with that. He's also trying to raise two teenage daughters who are having difficulty coping. Sean is only handling this case because he feels he can't abandon Marjorie's family. Marjorie's grandparents, Aunt Peg and Choppy, are elderly now. They're about to lose their home and all of their worldly possessions from taking out too many second mortgages to keep their family afloat. This is 2008 and the economy is crashing. They're barely hanging on by a thread. And so through flashbacks back to the 1970s during college and law school years when Sean was dreaming of a future with Marjorie, we see why he became so attached to her family and why he wants to save them now. Choppy is a colorful mill hunky, as he proudly describes himself. And that, incidentally, was a term of endearment in these ethnic communities. He's worked his whole life at the Cary Furnace in Rankin, which is a dirty, dangerous mill where people of every race and ethnicity placed loyalty and faithfulness to family and friends above all else. It was a true American melting pot. And it's that simple working class integrity that Sean admires so much in Choppy. And Aunt Peg, who again was really Marjorie's grandmother, has now been incapacitated by a stroke. She's forced to watch this trial silently from a wheelchair. In her day, though, Aunt Peg was an incredible lady, and she even shared with Sean in sort of clandestine chats with him over coffee and Slovak bread, private stories of how she and other ladies in the neighborhood survived World War II when men were shipped off to war and women had to work around the clock just to survive out of necessity. How did they do it and still raise their families? Aunt Peg tries to pass along her secrets to Sean, seeing that he and Marjorie are struggling with how they'll juggle two careers and still hold their lives together. together. So here's a little bit from that scene. Aunt Peg removed a loaf of town talk bread from the fridge and knocked it against her countertop to see if it had thawed enough for tuna sandwiches. Maybe it looked like we were poor bohunks, as some of these fancier people called us, but we had a magical network in place, Sean Boy, she said. Everyone was trained to help each other in the mills, and so they did the same at home. It's amazing to think about it now. We helped each other with cooking, even with the kids' schoolwork. We had close friends and family chipping in without ever asking. I look back and ask myself, how did we pull it off? Today, you'd have to be a damn millionaire to do all that. That's what Choppy always says. Aunt Peg walked over, staring out the window at the row of inselbrick sided houses beside her own, then kissed me on the forehead. I'm sharing these secrets with you, Sean Boy, because you're a very special person in our family. And Aunt Peg concluded, sometimes, Sean Boy, you have to settle for less now to get more in the long haul. Do you understand what I'm saying? I may be an old Slovak lady, but I'm 100% sure on this one. Of course, Sean and Marjorie don't end up together in the end. Things unravel, and I won't uh, tell you that story and ruin it. But now, Sean's in a no-win position. He cares about Choppy and Aunt Peg, doesn't want their lives destroyed. But in the midst of the trial, when Marjorie says she's coming back to testify, Sean becomes unglued. Why does she keep coming back into his life when she's already destroyed his plans and self-esteem once? And what is she hiding here? There are a lot of secrets about Marjorie's past that Sean wants to know about. But this story is as much about Sean's struggles as Marjorie's. Uh, he once had Pollyannish dreams of coming back to this shabby mill town where he grew up to do good for regular people, but now 
he's losing his faith in everything he once believed in. And this is something many people face in their lives. They suddenly look around and ask, did I make the right decisions or did I throw away opportunities to, and do something rash just because I thought it was noble at the time? And especially a person who took the less ordinary path, these doubts can haunt you and that's what's eating away at Sean right now. Coming out of Harvard Law School, Sean could have gone to big firms in New York or LA or Miami, any of the glittering destinations of that time period. He could have worked somewhere where he could pull down big bucks uh, and become a big shot partner at a law firm in, in seven years, or he could have uprooted himself and followed Marjorie to a new place called Silicon Valley, where she was trying to get a job with her degree in a new field called computer science. Instead, Sean followed his heart and his sense of duty, and he returned to Pittsburgh to this modest two-person law firm that handled wills and estates for non-glamorous people, thinking that this was his noble calling. But now, the mills and the factories in Pittsburgh have begun collapsing around him, and his shabby two-person law firm is just barely staying afloat. It's hardly a ticket to wealth and notoriety. He's doubting all of his big life decisions. And even worse, he's representing the one person he vowed never to go near again, literally or figuratively. Marjorie's reappearance is causing his mind to become scrambled and crazy, so Sean finally hits a wall. Standing in the courtroom, he turns to his millennial law associate, Jamie Vaskov, who's known as JV, who's eight months pregnant and is his closest confidant, and he snaps, you're taking over this case. Are you freaking out here, boss? JV demands to know. No, I'm not freaking out, he replies coolly. This is just too much to handle, so I'm bailing. You're a moot court champ. JD, uh, JV attended Duquesne Law Night School, of course. Uh, you know the case. You can deal with the witness counselor. So with zero time to prepare, JV is forced to stand in front of the judge and go for a Hail Mary pass. She knows that the old law that applies to this trust that says unwed mothers and their illegitimate children can't inherit from an estate except in a rare case. They're considered filius nullius, children of nobody. So she makes a desperate appeal to justice and equity as a last resort. And so here is this young law associate making her plea. The authority is there, Your Honor, J.V. said, pulling out the brief she'd completed the night before and handing it to the judge's clerk. If you read this memorandum, Your Honor, you'll see that the early cases going back to the creation of Orphan's Court give you a certain amount of inherent power when it comes to evaluating the equities of a case. Judge Wendell flipped through the brief and puffed out his cheeks as if thinking intently. We recognize that the intentions of the deceased ordinarily govern, J.V. continued, but what about the living? What if they were ruined by the acts of a decedent who's no longer around to pay the price? That's exactly what these equity cases talk about. Thick lines appeared on Judge Wendell's forehead as J.V. continued. What about the girl? What about the family who never got a dime from this man who preyed on young, vulnerable girls? JV pushed the red hair out of her face. She was sweating now. I started to worry that this emotional plea might be taking a physical toll on her. Think about your own experiences, Judge, JV concluded near, nearly inaudibly. Unless you cut off this sort of discriminatory conduct root and branch, the cancer of these injustices will keep eating away at our justice system forever. This is orphans court, Judge. You can do something different here. Fairness and equity matter in this place more than anyone out, anywhere else in the court system. Thank heavens that's true. Judge Wendell looked around the courtroom. He seemed to be examining the place that had been his judicial domain for 21 years. He stared at Aunt Peg in her wheelchair, her chin slumped against her shoulder, a slow, thin drool escaping from her lips. His eyes next moved toward Choppy, whose tongue was trying desperately to conceal a chew that he'd snuck into his lower lip to calm his nerves. So unfortunately, even the judge knows he's in a bind here. The evidence just isn't there. The now ancient nuns who worked at the Rosalia home 
can't testify about Marjorie being the true daughter of this perpetrator, Ralph Atmovic, it would breach their pledge of secrecy to thousands of girls and babies at the Rosalia home whose privacy they still had to safeguard. The whole situation is unraveling. The mortgage company is now foreclosing on Choppy and Aunt Peg's house. The sheriff's office has now served the papers and without giving anything away, I can tell you that Sean and his co-counsel decide to push the envelope too far in one final desperate attempt to achieve justice, and now they may face disbarment and have their own careers ruined. How can it get any worse? Which brings us to the more practical question, why in God's name would anyone work on a novel like this for 30 years? <laughs> So instead of trying to answer that question, I think I will sit down and let our fabulous moderator, Judge Kelly, and all of you ask the questions. So thanks for being part of this very special event, which I've been looking forward to since I was a kid reading books in these library stacks. So good evening, everyone. Um, many of you may have read reviews or articles about the book in the Post-Gazette or the Tribune Review or the Pitt News. Um, in the, those interviews, Ken, you talked about the intangible qualities of Pittsburgh that you thought were so important. Um, would you share with all of us sort of what uh, in those qualities you were trying to bring to light? Sure. Um, it's some of the things I just referred to. Uh, these qualities about being concerned for the greater good, uh, trying to preserve some of these values and traditions. And I, I felt really strongly about this, uh, Judge Kelly. I usually call her Mo, but I better call her Judge Kelly here. Um, <laughs> but I, I really think that we often don't uh, do enough to celebrate these things that are so special about Pittsburgh that define us. Uh, and I have Sean ask the question in the book of Marjorie at one point, what makes Pittsburgh Pittsburgh? And she says, well, I, I don't know, you mean Heinz ketchup, chipped ham? What, what are you talking about? And he doesn't like that answer. And later in the book, he asks that same question to JV, his young associate, and she says, it's the intangible things. There's no pretense. There's no hierarchy or pecking order. People really care about each other. And you know, when I was working on this, uh, Judge Kelly, I thought of an example of just how special this is. When I was a kid as a paper boy in Edgewood, there was a guy on my paper route named Mr. Kochik, and he would be there at 6.30 in the morning to, to greet me and talk about things. And I remember for my birthday one year, he came out with a little package, and inside was uh, one of these sets, a letter opener and scissors set. I don't know if you have any of those things, but, and he said, I want you to go to college. I think you can do this, and I want you to have this. And you know what? I just used it the other night. I still have it in my <laughs> desk drawer like 55 years later. But those, those kinds of things, that's rare. This doesn't exist in so many places. And that's what I was trying to capture here. And in your, your book, um, you talk, and you talked about it in your remarks this evening, about decisions that Sean, the primary character, had to make about his career, about where to live, about what to do with his life, both as a young lawyer uh, and as a mature lawyer. Um, how were those decisions that he had to make relevant to us today? And I know during COVID, many of us has, have thought about changing things, but um, how is what you saw Sean go through in your book relevant to all of us today? Well, for me, anyway, in writing this, that was one of the most important things that I was trying to get at. And I know it's probably a couple layers down, and so not uh, everyone uh, next necessarily spots it. But it's really, I was trying to look at the decisions of Sean as a young person, and then later in life as he's reflecting. So as a young person, 
he's having to decide what to do with himself. And I have spent so much time as a law professor and in, uh, in practice advising young uh, law students and college students who have dreams of what they want to do and they talk about these things. And so many of them say, well, you know what, I'm going to do that later. I'll come back to that. But for now, I have to earn money and work at this big firm or do this or whatever. And you know what? That later never comes in most cases. And so you have to take a stand at a certain point. And that's what he was doing here, Sean, in deciding what he was going to do with his career. And it's not easy when you do something that's off the beaten path of what people consider prestigious and important. And then comes the second part of that story, and that is, and I'm sure many of you in the audience have experienced this in different ways, we all do, but at some point in the middle of his life, he says, did I screw everything up? Did I really, was this really a smart decision? Think of all the things I could have done. And it's really, his daughters and JV and his old friends from law school who allow him to, real, to kind of startle him and remind him and to take stock in his life and realize the, that what he is doing really is an incredibly noble thing and all the people he's helping. But it, he, it isn't glamorous. It isn't anything that is getting him lots of great attention, but it is a rich life. And it takes a lot for him to realize that. But that was one of the important stories that I wanted to tell in this mode because I do think that lots of people, uh, in the end, I think that people have to create their own definition of success. You can't let others push you into it and tell you what it is. And just because something isn't prestigious by other people's standards, you bring prestige to that position. And that's what he ends up discovering through a lot of other people helping him that he actually has managed to do in his life. And when you talk about the rich life, I think for him, a significant part of his life was service. And I think that's something that's a special quality of people in Pittsburgh. Yeah, and service in a lot of different ways. I mean, service in just helping ordinary people. Service, uh, so you can be like Patrick, who was in public service, and you, who's in public service as a judge. You can do all sorts of things, but are you primarily there to do things to help others, or is this just a ride that you're on to try to amass all of these other things? And ultimately, uh, I can tell you that it, it is the people who do things that they really care about that are aimed at serving others who have the more, most fulfilling careers, uh, but it's not always an easy ride along the way. So speaking of careers, you've written two books, um, two very significant bestsellers, Death of American Virtue, Clinton versus Starr, which I think I read one chapter of that book sitting next to you on an airplane when it was in draft mode. I think it was uh, <laughs> dinner with um, Linda Tripp, if I remember correctly. But um, you've written two bestsellers, uh, the Clinton versus Starr book as well as the Archibald Cox book. In your career, how was the transition from writing those two books to writing fiction? They're very different. If yeah. you could talk about that. Yeah, and uh, again, you know, fiction is a lot harder, I think, at least for me. But it was also natural, and this is what a lot of people, you know, wouldn't know necessarily because they think, wow, this guy wrote about, you know, Clinton and, and Watergate. But actually, it all started for me when I was a writer at the Pitt News, right over in the Cathedral of Learning here. Uh, I wrote feature stories about weird things. I would do weird things and write about them. This was the era of Studs Terkel and George Plimpton and, and uh, Hunter Thompson. And so you experienced life and wrote about it. So I set a Guinness World Record in brick carrying. I wrestled a bear and I lost. Uh, and so. I, I did a lot of that kind of writing and won the first Rolling Stone College Journalism Award for feature writing, actually doing that. And then when I was in Boston, I continued to write for, for uh, weekly papers and came back 
and wrote for the Pittsburgh Press when the Pittsburgh Press still existed about George Benson growing up in the Hill District or uh, Skeetersville, the little town that, that we called it along the, the uh, Monongahela River there. And so from doing that, I learned to write about characters. I learned to try to capture dialogue and, and how people spoke in, in this region. And so that was my, that was really how I learned to do things. And so it was a natural thing for me to want to do fiction. And, and quite honestly, all of those uh, experiences and all of those skills, because writing is a skill, you just have to work at it and work at it. But writing those kinds of things helped me uh, work on the earliest drafts of this, which helped me write the Cox book and the Clinton book, which helped me in turn go back and keep rewriting this. And so, you know, writing is, good writing is good writing is good writing, and you have to hone your craft. But learning how to capture characters and dialogue is crucial to fiction. Did you do any particular training or talk <laughs> to people, or you just sort of worked through it? I took one journalism course at Pitt with Lee Goodkin, a great writer. Uh, but I just learned it on the job doing the Pitt News and, and just doing writing projects. And so there was no specific uh, training for any of this, but I really do think that ultimately uh, there is no substitute if you're gonna be a writer to just sitting down and writing. Now. You do, and I really do think, incidentally, that writing for newspapers and magazines, it was invaluable to me because stop and think about it. You know, my, these books took eight years, 10 years. If you're just sitting in a room writing this stuff and have no idea if you're really a good writer, this could be a disaster. You know, so <laughs> at least if you Not write- Not only professionally, but personally as yes, well. Yes, <laughs> and maritally, yes. And so um, at least if you're writing for, and your story ap appears on the front page of the features section of the Pittsburgh Press on a Sunday, you know that, yeah, I guess I do know how to do this and people uh, react to it. And so that's part of the training is to uh, uh, learn how to do the Little Earth projects to tide you over while you do these massive projects that are so solitary. So you were a law school dean, now university professor, um, husband, father, now grandfather. Um, <laughs> How long did it take you to write the book, and how did you find the time, or better yet, where did you find the time to write it? Yeah, well, as I said, it, it took over 30 years, but who's counting? Um, <laughs> Laura but, is. <laughs> yeah, I know. Well, but quite honestly, that was 30 years doing all these other jobs in between. This thing would be put off into a, shell, uh, into a uh, drawer for five years at a time, and then in between other projects, I'd pull it out, and actually Laura would roll her eyes at that point when I would pull it back out. Uh, I did avoid 30 years of chores by working on this book, uh, but um, I had the book come out on Laura's birthday, October 12th, because she really was the person who made it possible, and, and Laura's here, so we, could we give her a round of applause, everyone? Um, you know, you have to, if you don't have a, a supportive spouse or partner, it's impossible to do this. It is a very solitary work. Uh, and I always said that if we got paid a nickel for every hour I spent working on this little book, we could have got a mansion somewhere. But instead, we've stayed in Forest Hills, and I dedicated the book to her. So, you know, it's a kind of... But, um, you know, for me it was uh, having that support and, and just doing it because quite honestly, I found it to be stress release for me. I mean, some people like to go to the movies or whatever, I like to just go and create things and to me it's very relaxing and so uh, it was something I didn't have a timeline on but I also have never started a project I didn't finish and I wasn't gonna let this be the first one. Well, we're glad you, did, you finished this. <laughs> Uh, many people talk about writing a book. I think people who are in this room this evening, uh, some of you may have that in the back of your head. Very few people follow through on it. 
Can you talk to us about how much research you really had to do? It's one thing to go in your uh, bedroom in your home and shut the door and say, I'm gonna take a couple hours and work on writing. But in terms of substantive research to create something like the heiress of Pittsburgh. Yeah, there's a lot of historical fiction in this. And so, you know, I, I went and hung out with uh, people, mill workers in Rankin on their stoops on the weekend just to talk and get a feel for, you know, their stories. And, and I got to go on the blast furnace floor at the Edgar Thompson Mill to just watch it, to, to see it. I talked to Cyril Wecht when I was writing the exhumation segment to try to get those details correct. Uh, as I mentioned, I talked to a, the, a bunch of the Sisters of Charity who had actually worked at the Rosalia home. So even though this is fiction and you can make things up, and I did change locations and things like this, you, you try to get it right. You try to make it accurate. And I worked really hard at that. And I, I think that's apparent uh, for those of you who uh, have not had the opportunity to read it yet. I was amazed by just the incredible detail uh, that is in your book. Um, one of the things I wanted to ask you about is, who did you let see the book? I know when you wrote Clinton versus Starr, um, I read a couple draft chapters, um, and I believe there was a consulting book club, some of the members <laughs> may be here this evening, uh, who may have looked at drafts for you. So how did you handle that? Yeah, I had a lot of people read, I'm a big believer of having people read things, although it's scary to have, you know, to really you have to have it ready enough that you're prepared for the reaction. But uh, one of my good friends from growing up at St. Anselm's, Michelle Keen DeMeissen, are you here somewhere out there, Michelle? There she is over there. And some of, and Jean Ann Hattler at Duquesne, is Jean Ann here? And a bunch of, let's raise your hand if you were in the fa best book club in the world. Okay, let's know, have a round so, of applause for these folks. And Susan Showalter. Uh, but they, they went through the book once in the, you know, it was about a year before it went into editing, had some great suggestions and then went through, we did a Zoom session a second time, but one example, for instance, is in every chapter you see a title, the location and the year uh, and, and, and a chapter name, but that was something that the book club came up with because when you're moving in time with these flashbacks, you can get jolted if you don't know which, you know, whether you're in 2008 or the 1970s. And that's just one of many examples of the great ideas I got from the book club. But it is really, you know, you're exposing yourself to people when you share your work. And I did say to Michelle, I do remember, I don't know if you remember this, Michelle, I said, look, if you don't like it, don't tell me because I got nothing else to give. <laughs> Well, that, that leads into another question, actually. In writing the novel, did you keep everything, or were there points where you threw things out? Or you had oh, to cut things? You have to cut things all the time. I mean, you know, any writer, and it's painful. It, it really is. It's, you know, uh, it's one of the hardest things to do, but you're constantly tossing stuff overboard because if it doesn't contribute to the arc of the story, you really can't do it. I mean, and so you're just constantly looking at things that you have to pare down. Is there anything you cut that you would share with us tonight or talk about? No, no, <laughs> no, I did Mo, Mo warned me that she might ask me this, so I'm looking. I, I, I told him to come prepared. Uh, hold on, I did bring something. If I'm allowed to go up to that other microphone. I'm it's a hometown crowd, you're safe. Hometown crowd, and I've never shared this with anyone. Uh, this is actually an excerpt from a 2005 version of the novel that was called at that time, The Soul, S-O-L-E, Heir of Pittsburgh. So let me uh, read this. Please, thank you. Marjorie's mother, Lil, emerged from the library stacks empty-handed. I took out Cuckoo's Nest last month and got the whole plot goofed up. She clomped over toward Marjorie and me. Why read the book and have to guess what the author meant when you can just watch the movie? Marjorie's fingernails dug into the back of my hand. She glanced at her mother, then yanked me out the door. See you in an hour, mother. As we bolted down the hallway, the Carnegie Library of Pittsburgh opened up around us like a magnificent palace of learning. 
Sunlight cut through the high window panes, making the marble steps shine like pearls at our feet. The steps were worn at the center as if water had run over them for centuries. In reality, it was hundreds of thousands of shoes that had poured down those marble steps since the library had opened its doors in 1895, a gift from Andrew Carnegie to the people of Pittsburgh, who'd earned him a fortune by sweating and meeting untimely deaths in his steel mills. Once we reached the basement, Marjorie and I detoured into Dinosaur Hall, a dark cavernous room filled with prehistoric bones suspended by massive cables. It reduced us to miniature shadow box figures as we clicked along the marble floor. In the next room, I gasped. A glass encased diorama of camel driver attacked by lion took me by surprise, <laughs> even though I should have expected it after years of school trips and visits to the museum as a kid. The camel's neck was bent, its teeth bared in a silent dromedarian scream, blood dripping from the lion's claws while a turbaned Arab fought to drive a knife into the aggressor's, aggressor's pelt. Look, a new display for the bicentennial. A group of school children was admiring a reenactment of red-coated soldiers being ambushed by military men, French, in blue uniforms and Native Americans in wild colors wearing breech clouts but little else. It was a portrayal of General Braddock, George Braddock's defeat as he led British troops to slaughter, thinking he would capture Fort Duquesne at the confluence of the Three Rivers. As General Braddock had handed over his sword and blood-stained sash to a young 23-year-old aide-de-camp named George Washington, he had gasped as his final words, we shall better know how to deal with them another time. So the foundations of the American Revolution had really been laid here in western Pennsylvania, just a few miles up the Monongahela River near the Edgar Thompson Mill of my childhood. Philadelphians always took far too much credit for giving birth to America, as if everything west of Independence Hall was chopped ham. There you go. I warned him. I was. I asked him to bring something. Yeah, Mo, Mo asked me, and I. I remember that was actually an early in an early chapter of the book, and you can see why I cut it. I mean, there was just <laughs> too. I got excited about all of this Pittsburgh history, and I remember some uh, someone. I can't rem remember who it was. Michelle at the book club saying, "You don't have enough anything in here about the Revolutionary War." I said, "Believe me, I had it." <laughs> It went overboard there. But you do have to discipline yourself to get rid of stuff. Once the story crystallizes and takes shape, you just have to part with those things that don't contribute to telling the story. Well, and to go from older history to the millennial, I, I'm going to make a quick transition. But I was really intrigued by JV, um, Sean's young millennial associate who's expecting. Um, as I read the book, as a former trial lawyer and now being a trial judge uh, in the federal court for 10 years, she reminded me of a lot of the young women who come in front of me and who I mentor who are struggling to juggle career and family and children. So I was wondering if you could share with us how you came up with the character of JV and what her character symbolizes in this book because as the book goes on she takes more and more of a powerful role in terms of the plot and in terms of Sean's um, development. Yeah JV was a really fun character to create and there truly was no JV but she was a composite of dozens of young women that I you know talked to and dealt with at the Bar Association people you knew too. Uh, you know, she was really important. JV is kind of a mongrel. You know, she, she's from Pittsburgh. She's part uh, different nationalities. She's intrepid. She went to Duquesne Law School even while she was working during law school. She's married to, uh, her husband is black, Calvin, and they moved from Mount Lebanon to, uh, to Lawrenceville because it was, it was a place where they felt their mixed race kids would fit in, blend in better, but she, she becomes important because she is the person who really looks after Sean and who helps him to understand what's so important. But as he's trying to figure out what really his life is about for him, JV becomes an important part of that because he recognizes that his mission in life 
is to help all of these beautiful qualities that he cared about so much in the Pittsburgh of his youth find a new generation, to be reinvented for a new generation, and that is JV for him. And that's the person that he is putting all of his, you know, hope behind because she really represents all of these best things, but in, for a new era. Thank you. All right, look up at the screen. We have the globe. It's on the cover of the book. It's also in the context of the plot. Tell us the significance of the globe and where it came from or how it was developed. Well, uh, I can't help myself, so I get involved in every aspect of a book, including the artwork and everything. So I've been working with a friend of mine from Swissvale, Matt Cambick, since we were kids. And I would write stuff, and even when we were at the Pitt News, and Matt, I would draw things that a third grader would draw, and then Matt would turn them into beautiful artwork. And so Matt is now living in New Zealand, so we were doing this across time zones, but I would sketch out th things. And so I did a first version of the cover. It was totally different, a woman kind of like Joe Majerak bending steel over the river. Uh, and he sends it- I like it, this much better. Yeah, he sent it to me, <laughs> I hated it. I mean, I, it was my own idea and I hated it. And then I was talking, and you know uh, Allison Salentic, who taught with me at, at Duquesne Law School and now lives in Texas, but she's read many iterations of the novel. And she said, why don't you take, because in that picture I did, I had, you know, old Pittsburgh, new Pittsburgh, and the little cozy hamlet of, you know, like Swissvale in it. And she said, why don't you do, put it in a globe? And I love snow globes, and I said, hey, this is it. So I actually went back and wrote the snow globe into the story. And, and it, you know, for me, is, is perfect. And then I sketched this out, and you'd never know it, but this, I sent him a picture of the teeny, teeny little house on the left-hand corner is a picture of my house where I grew up uh, <laughs> in Edgewood. But it's meant to symbolize you know, the old, the new, everything coming together, and the future, what he's what he's hoping for. And I don't want to, for people who didn't read it, I don't want to talk about the significance of that at the end, but it is very significant for him in the story. Uh, so we've gathered here in a library. Um, people may not be aware of this. You're donating the royalties from this book to a special initiative at Duquesne. Do you want to talk about that for a second? Yeah, well, uh, I really believe that students who are interested in creative writing need a lot of support because it is, it, it is a tough, uh, lonely enterprise. And so Laura and I decided from the get-go that any money from this would go to a special initiative at Duquesne for students interested in creative writing. And actually, uh, what day is today? Thursday. On f Saturday, we're hosting a writer's conference conference for writers from this region and a little bit of the funds will be used to have seven of our students be registered and attend this so that they can rub elbows with you know well well known writers in this region but i think it's really important the tools of writing and creative writing are valuable to so many things even if you don't end up writing a book like this. I think it's just a, a very special thing for people who are gifted in it, and I want to try to help them. Uh, I had bought a good number of the books that I shared with friends at, at Christmas. Um, and uh, I texted one of them and said, I was doing this tonight, and they said, oh, please ask Ken, is there going to be a sequel? No, please ask Laura. The answer is absolutely not. You have 30 years of chores that you have pawned off. But, um, no. And the first grandchild has just Yes, arrived. and Jackson Joseph was born in October, and we have another baby, grandbaby coming. Uh, our son and daughter-in-law are expecting next month, so I like to say we're on a better roll than the Steelers in the Gormley family. <laughs> and so, no, I'm going to leave that... Judge Mo to these students at Duquesne there and Pitt go. and others and let them write the sequel. There you go. Let me ask one last question. Um, the title of the book, The Heiress of Pittsburgh. <laughs> you know what I'm gonna ask. Who is the heiress of Pittsburgh? I would be crazy to tell you no one would buy the book, <laughs> Mo. Uh, 
No, let, let me give you a hint. I don't think there's necessarily one answer. There was one answer in my mind as I started writing it, but I think it's meant to be left to people to think about that a little bit. Uh, I've gotten a lot of, I, I like to quiz people about that, and I've got a lot of different answers, and so I think I'll just leave it to each person to, to reach their own conclusion when they get to the end. And I've asked my friends who've read the book who the heiress of Pittsburgh is, and they've all had very different answers at the end. It could be you, Judge Mo. <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> all right, anything else? No, it's, it's just so wonderful to have all of you here. I know it's been a tough couple of years, and it's wonderful to be back in person. And again, my thanks to my family who's here and all of the friends from different, I know there's some Swiss Vale friends and others, but it is very special because in many ways, this library represents for all of us where we got our start in terms of many of our careers. And so it couldn't be a better place to have the official launch of the Heiress of Pittsburgh. Wonderful. And I think Stephanie is giving us the high sign. So, ladies and gentlemen, I thank you for being with us this evening. It's wonderful to be out as hopefully we move out of COVID. And President Ken Gormley, the heiress of Pittsburgh.